Got a Popeye's chicken sandwich. Everybody here. Emmanuel Emmy Acho. My dog. How's it going? It's all good. Can't you level of fame with the second Emmy? Anything changed? Nah, bro. No? We'll get a better watch. Ain't nothing changed with my change. I'm going to stay the same. Wayne. All right, let's get it started with Last Night's nice Thriller. And boy, was it a thriller because everybody was dying and living and dying and living again. Lamar Jackson had over 300 total yards last night, including the touchdown pass. Remember that, Acho, when we start arguing? But the former MVP also fumbled, not once, but twice, including a huge one in overtime to help set up the game, winning touchdown by the Raiders. Lamar was asked about it after the game. Take a listen. You had two fumbles, which are unusual. Yep. How much that? That tipped me off. You know, I, I hate fumble. I hate any type of turnover. Um, but the the first one that tipped me off because we had them right. There. It was right down there. You know, they little punch zone. They could have scored right then and there. Um, that tipped me off. Then the last one, um, just two hands on the ball. Try to have two hands on the ball. Could have just took a sack if anything. But it happens. Football. So Acho, don't tick me off. <laughs> you worried about Lamar Jackson? Calm down now. Calm down. Yes and no. Yes. Let's start with the no. Let's start with the no. Yes. <laughs> um, the reason I'm not worried about Lamar Jackson is because it appears his receivers are going to do some good for him this year. Bingo. Hollywood Brown, first round pick from two years ago. Not last year, but the year prior. He showed up. Shout there out to is. Hollywood Brown. There it Sammy is. Sammy Watkins had some highs and some lows in his NFL career. Had some health issues. He showed up. Rashad there Bateman did not even play, and they didn't get much from Devin Duvernay at the wide receiver position. Obviously, on special teams, he did his thing. For that reason, I'm not too worried. Other reason, Lamar Jackson, he's lost so many running backs. We thought he was going to have to do it himself. He might eventually, but I, as a linebacker, watching the game with a defensive eye, I saw some things from Murray. I saw some things from Latavius Murray that were encouraging in my eyes. I was like, you know what? Give him a couple weeks. I think he will be okay. Mm -hmm. The greatest reason, I'm not worried, Lamar Jackson from the past game. 235 yards passing does not seem like a lot, but remember, that's the third most passing yards Lamar Jackson would have had in his last 17 games. Mm -hmm. Last year, he only eclipsed 235 twice all season long. He did that opening night. So it appeared that the Ravens are making a more concerted effort in Lamar Jackson's passing game. It appears they're making a more concerted effort to find his receivers downfield. You saw that ball to Sammy Watkins he threw. You saw finding Hollywood Brown in the end zone on a scramble play. A couple years back, I don't know if Hollywood Brown would have been able to figure out how to get open, and Lamar Jackson would have found him. Eventually, him and Mark Andrews will click even better, so I'm not worried about that. Let's go. For all of those reasons, I am not worried about Lamar Jackson. But boy, Sam! Boy, you got a big butt. That butt is yes, huge. that one is. Mm. I'm not going to get fired, so I will not make any announcements. Peaches! <laughs> but, um, yes, that one is a big, large, all-caps butt. 100% injury ratio in the National Football League. All of last year in September, Marcellus was telling me, well, Acho, Dak Prescott ain't never got hurt, so your 100% injury ratio statistic can't be accurate. You remember that? That was early in our show. What? <laughs> And then Dak Prescott, unfortunately, Did. got hurt. Yes. Lamar Jackson, so many people would say, and they would be accurate in saying, he's never missed a game due to injury. But we remember the end of last season, mm. the Bills game, he got concussed. If the Ravens would have won that game, Lamar Jackson probably would have been doubtful the next week. So he actually left that game due to injury in the playoffs, maybe one of the biggest games of Lamar Jackson's career. Why am I concerned? Because my dog took 12 hits yesterday rushing the ball intentionally. Mm. Then he took three sacks yesterday while trying to pass the ball. Keep in mind, y'all, Lamar Jackson's only 6'2", 210. I'm going to save a lot more of that for my next lap. Mm. Keep y'all dialed in. But I'm not concerned. There is that big butt, though, I'm going to get into later. Okay. I'm glad you had a balanced approach because I just thought you were going to come in hot one-sided and we were going to argue up. That's why I wore my suit this color. Um, we aren't going to argue here. Am I worried about Lamar Jackson? No. Am I slightly concerned? Uh, yeah, because I've been here before. And I've been here on the side of the predator, not the prey. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know who Ted Cottrell is. Ted Cottrell is one of the best defensive minds the football's ever seen. Ted Cottrell was Wade Phillips's defensive coordinator when Wade Phillips was a head coach. He was my coach in Buffalo. Ted Cottrell gave it to you real, gave it to you raw, and he gave it to you in a brilliant way. One thing he used to say is the memo's out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is the memo is out? And he used to say this about players, certain players, because I played in the era of Barry Sanders and cats like that, where it was like, you ain't going to stop them. 
but it's time to send a message. Mm -hmm. So every time you can get your hands on him, put some hands on him. We talking about oomph. We talking about to the echo of the whistle. We talking about we gonna make him feel it. So next time he goes around, he gonna think about it. The memo's out on you, Lamar Jackson, brother, brother, brother. Watch out. They shooting. Major, look, Lamar Jackson's getting hit like, we know that you are a special threat. We know that you are X Factor. So now you're starting to see them tee off on Lamar Jackson. And it's not just in the intensity of hit. It's also intensifying how many times they're hitting him and quantity. You brought that up. Let me add some context to this. There were 13 pressures from one player by the name of Max Crosby. And now Max is a beast to me. I like him. He's a little, a little old school if we want to go Jared Allen in mm -hmm. the sense, but a little more octane than even my boy Jared Allen, who was a monster, future Hall of Famer. 13 pressures from him. Let me give you some context in two ways. One, he had the most pressures of any defensive lineman last week. That includes T.J. Watt, who just got all that money, who balled out. And it also includes Chandler Jones, who just had five sacks. Wait a minute. I know pressures is not the most interest in the statistics. But that means you got to the quarterback more so than anybody else in the NFL last week. But he didn't get the sacks. You know why? Because that's the gift and the curse of Lamar Jackson. He's so special. You can get here, but you ain't going to get here. I love that about Lamar Jackson. But let me give you context in a different way. Everyone after the Super Bowl kept telling me about Patrick Mahomes and giving him excuses, giving him passes, giving him a nice mattress to lie on because he was getting pressured. His offensive line was hurt. Oh, my God. Do you know the pressure rate in the, in the Super Bowl for Lamar, for uh, Patrick Mahomes, excuse me, was 52 percent? Do you know what it was last night for Lamar Jackson? 54 percent. He took more heat last night. You didn't see it. You didn't feel the effect because Lamar Jackson is that special. He took more heat last night than we saw Patrick Mahomes do in the Super Bowl. What am I worried about? Nothing. What am I slightly concerned about? These dudes are getting here. It's taking special abilities of Lamar Jackson to escape, and more so when they do get him the few times, boy, they putting hands on him. Yeah, let's go even deeper. Because, y'all, in football, there's a difference between making a tackle and hitting somebody. Let's go. Let's go. Again, I talk about it. My senior year, I was playing in college, playing against Colin Klein. He ends up being a Heisman finalist uh, for Kansas State. He was a quarterback. Senior night. I wasn't trying to make tackles. Nobody on our defense was trying to make tackles. We were trying to hit him <laughs> en route to making a tackle. Because right. we knew if you cut off a head, the body dies. It's gone. And Lamar Jackson is the head to the Baltimore Ravens. Kansas State, Colin Klein, he was the head to uh, the Kansas State Wildcats. And we knew at that time, if we can take him out, you can take everybody out. Like so that. when you go to make that tackle, it's not about making a tackle. It's about hitting mm. him mm. and making sure that he feels it. Because just Dang. like in boxing, it's not the first body shot that knocks him out. It's the aggregation of punches and eventually... Yeah. They tap. Mm hmm Gotta go. You're exactly right in talking about defenders now look like they're not just trying to make tackles. Mm -mm. They're trying to hit Lamar Jackson. Early on in his career, 18, 19, 20, it's just like, hey, just get him down. Defense coordinator, <laughs> I don't care, just get him down. Get him down. <laughs> right. Now it's like, hey, make sure he feels it. Mm -hmm. make, sure you, make sure you push on Lamar Jackson as you stand up on top of the pile. So we also have to talk about it like this. Mm. Lamar Jackson, postseason and regular season, has 520 carries. The uh -huh. next closest quarterback is Josh Allen with 308. Lamar Jackson has 212 more carries than the next closest at the position. What that is roughly is three and a half more football games of hits. Mm. Not just Lamar Jackson playing three and a half more games. Mm. On average, 60 plays per game. So 60, 120, 180 to 212. Texas. You're talking about three and a half more games of Lamar Jackson just getting hit. Mm. Imagine Lamar played three straight games just taking hits. Mm. That is what he has experienced in his career more than Josh Allen. Keep in mind, Josh Allen, 6'4 and a half, 245. Lamar Jackson, 6'2, 210. Y'all do the math. So I'm worried because we haven't seen Lamar Jackson get hurt up to this point. But just like I think it may have been the great ba great Babe Ruth who said, man, my next strikeout only brings me to my next home run. Mm. 
Lamar Jackson's next injury-free game, in theory, is only bringing him closer to getting injured, particularly when you're running the ball this much. So I love that they're trying to take the approach to air it out. Yeah. Keep doing that. Because mm -hmm. I think now Lamar Jackson's becoming more lethal with his arm, and that will help in the long term. But you can't watch that game last night where he fumbles twice mm -hmm. in route to putting the game away and not be concerned or worried at all. Yeah, I hear you. But I'm not going to be worried because sometimes it doesn't add up. Like, like... The most talented quarterback ever is not the best quarterback ever. It doesn't add up, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you look at a guy and you could give his physics, you could give his measurables, but it doesn't add up. He's not injury prone. Let's look at uh, Warwick Dunn, my dad. Um, another guy that people don't know him, but my boy, Dennis Northcutt, played 10 plus years in the league, never injured. Never injured. Like, no surgeries, nothing. Little is hell. Warwick Dunn, 5'9, 180. Ever injured? I don't remember. So the point is, it doesn't always add up. We've not seen Lamar Jackson hurt just yet. It doesn't add up. But he needs protection. He needs it up front because, boy, they are coming, and they are coming with a message in mind. I saw some special things last night. And it's weird, the team that won, I wasn't as impressed with as the team that lost. Kind of reminds me of the Buffalo-Pittsburgh game. I wasn't that impressed with Pittsburgh, except that they got a little bit of a running game. And certainly they got a runner in Najee Harris. But I was impressed a little bit by Buffalo, and I said, that's a better team. Mm -hmm. I look at this game yesterday, and I say, the Raiders, y'all in trouble. Even though Lamar Jackson gave away the game, let's talk about how this game really played out. <laughs> the Raiders, what the hell? You got a quarterback that has the most passing yards in week one, and y'all still in a dogfight, if not behind, for three quarters to a team with the quarterback that can't throw. Whatever that means. You see them get all this pressure on Lamar Jackson, and they still find themselves behind. You see all of this adding up, and you start to realize, I don't know what the formula for success truly is for the Raiders just yet, and I don't think they do. But for this team, Lamar Jackson and the Ravens, you know what's going to happen? That passing game is going to mature. That running game is interesting because they are down firepower in terms of names, but they're not necessarily in terms of game. Lamar Jackson, as you pointed out, touches the football in the running game. He touches the football more than any offensive player in the NFL. That will obviously have an effect in terms of your injury rate and your percentage of potential injury. But it just doesn't add up because you can't get a clean one on them. So when I hear the word worried, that's something that keeps me up at night. You know what keeps me up at night? Playing against Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. Not actually looking at Lamar Jackson as a health concern. Because right now, so far in his career, hasn't added up. Let me give you the biggest worry. Let me give you all the biggest worry and why really there's really no denying this. If you are a Ravens fan, you should be concerned because you all keep bringing a knife to a gunfight. What, what gunfight? The NFL, the last 20 years, really last 18 if you want to get specific, has turned into a passing league. The way they call it, passing league. The way they officiate it, passing league. The yes, way we spread true, it out, true, passing league. True. But the problem is the Ravens are a running offense. Ravens rushed for 189 yards yesterday. The Raiders only rushed for 82 yards yesterday. Win Baltimore. Problem the Raiders passed for 435 yards yesterday. Lamar Jackson passed for 235 yards yesterday. Problem, y'all know this as well as I do. Why in God's name would you drive when you can fly? <laughs> and the Ravens <laughs> continue to drive to their destination. Oh, the Raiders yeah. last night, they flew to their destination. Mm. And that's why they arrived at the final destination, which was a win. Mm. Lamar Jackson's passed for under 235 yards under 250 yards, 37 times in his 42 starts. Mm. Derek Carr just passed for over 400 like it was nothing. Mm. So my biggest concern is these Ravens, they showing up to the fight, and they showing up with a weapon. But the problem is they're showing up with a knife, and they out there just shooting them long bombs, mm. rugs, long bombs, Waller, long bombs, Edwards. The reason the Raiders won the game was because of their X plays. X plays, plays of 20 yards or more. Y'all look at it here. The Raiders, what they did best passing the ball, seven pass plays of 20 yards or more. The Ravens, what they did best running the ball, two running plays of 20 yards or more. The Raiders are getting yards easier than the Ravens. The opposition of the Ravens will get yards easier than the Ravens. The Ravens are working harder. Their opponents are working smarter just by nature of their style of play. That's probably my biggest concern in Baltimore. Man, 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 I'm glad you don't live in Baltimore. I'm glad I do a show with you. I always got something to fight against because what you just said to the people out there, 
they probably took it, digested it, ran to their homeboys, if not group text. Man, I told just killed that he just Marcellus. That little emoji with the brains coming out. All right, here eat them. You just said you gotta pass the ball to win in the NFL. You got it's a passing league. It is. Okay, let's just look at last week. I love to do this. Mm -hmm. Quick step size. Uh, the top five passing quarterbacks in week one. You think more won or more lost their games? You know, if I'm asking, you know what it is. <laughs> they didn't win. Talk to me. Derek Carr. Oh, yeah, you were number one. Mm -hmm. Y'all won. Who was next? Dak, Dak Prescott. Prescott. Did he win? Damn it, damn it, damn it. Okay, let's go after that. Forget that. Tom Brady, did he win? Yes. I just starting to feel good at group text looking right. Who after that? Get quiet. Kirk Cousins. Mm -hmm. That ain't going well. And then who's after that? No way. Jared Goff? Where the hell that come from? Okay, so Acho, stop telling everybody that don't. The easier in the fly. It doesn't work that way. Lamar Jackson actually had a higher quarterback rating than Baker Mayfield last week. You know I got to give my Baker shout out. Bah, bah, bah. That's amazing. How did that turn out uh, for both of them? <laughs> Let's go here. Do you know that Trevor Lawrence actually had more passing yards than Matthew Stafford? <laughs> week one. Who won their game? Matthew Stafford. It's a lot of ways up the mountain, man. Stop being that guy that's mainstream. It is. You get up there any way you can. 40 games in a row, the Ravens have rushed for 100-plus yards. Lo second longest streak in NFL history, right? Next closest team is number, has seven straight games. It doesn't matter how you get there, brother, as long as you arrive. That's fair. But arrive. I'm saying I'd rather take the easiest route to me get too. there. Me but too. the bigger disconnect here <laughs> for oh, me, me is, are you passing out of necessity or are you passing out of ability? Ooh. Because, again, mm. figures don't lie. Liars figure. A liar's figure. <laughs> Jared Goff and the Detroit Lions, they were down by 20 the Facts. majority of Facts. that game. Facts. He had to air it out. Facts. Trevor Lawrence, he threw three picks, and they were down the majority of that game. Facts. He had to air it out. Dak Prescott, Cowboys, they actually were up. Close. They were close, yeah. but they couldn't run the ball at all. So he had to air it out. Okay. Necessity, necessity, necessity. Facts, facts, facts. I just want to make sure that the Ravens have the ability to when they can. After... The Raiders had that interception in overtime. Baltimore gets the ball back. Lamar gets the ball back. He fumbles. Raiders get the ball right back. If the Raiders didn't have a prolific passing offense, they might not have scored with these. Mm -hmm. But instead, second play after they get the ball back, they come out in a little bunch, pick route, easy touchdown to the point where Marlon Humphrey, maybe the third best cornerback in the league, just gave up on the play. He was like, what? He was like, man, it's over. Y'all beat me. me. Y'all got me. Because of the ease in which the Raiders were able to do that by throwing the ball, they simply won the game. My biggest concern is not that you can't win running, but you're just making it harder on yourself, big dog. You're just making it a little too hard. I don't like it. You're right. You're right. If you combine the injury concern with the fact that you are picking the harder route to success, I give you all that. I'm still not worried, though, because I saw Lamar Jackson go out there with combined passing and rush yards. 321. Hasn't seen that since week 16, 2019. What happened in 2019? And the Miss MVP. Coming up, the new member of Fox Sports, Mark Sanchez. Uh -oh. <laughs> do they call him Sanchez for real? Sanchez? I do. Sanchez? I do. Knows a thing or two about you. My dog. SC. We'll ask him about Clay Helton being fired. But first, Mark called the 49ers game on Sunday. He'll help us answer if we can trust Kyle Shanahan's two quarterback plan. That's next on Speak for Yourself. The insider, Sanchez. Confronting performance concerns has historically been every guy's worst nightmare. Trekking to the doctor's office, another awkward conversation followed by a long wait at the pharmacy. Thankfully, help is here at BlueChew.com, offering the first chewables with the same active ingredients as well-known alternatives. So you'll be 100% confident every time. Plus, your online consultation is free and delivery arrives in discreet packaging. No one knows. Here's a special deal for our listeners. Try it for free when you use promo code Fox Sports at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code Fox Sports to receive your first month free. Now, Kyle Shanahan showed off his two-quarterback system in the 49ers <laughs> win over the Lions Sunday. Jimmy G got the start and finished with over 300 yards passing. Made Marcella smile. Uh, and he also had a touchdown. Meanwhile, Trey Lance saw some action in the first quarter, and his only pass was a touchdown. Ah, it brings so much elation to my mind, my eyes. To say we're Let's joined do by it. Let's do it. Member, Fox member, NFL analyst, my former teammate with the Eagles, my dog, mm -hmm. Mark Sanchez, the man they call Sanchez. Now, yes. Sanchez actually called the game, did a phenomenal job doing Appreciate it. I listened to it. Well done, my brother. Mm -hmm. uh, Basel, you up first, man. Do you trust 
Kyle Shanahan's two quarterback plan after the win? I do trust it after the win. I do trust it after seeing it because it's not really a two quarterback system. Like this was all hype. I thought it was going to be 50 50 split, something of that nature, seeing them go out there and then in the middle of a series, okay, you come out for half the reps and I go back out for half the reps. This was just a glorified Gatorade break for Jimmy G at times, right? Let's be real. 51 snaps, Jimmy G. Jimmy G. Q deserves it. Only four snaps for Trey Lance. Now we're talking. When you see defensive tackles come back in and back and forth, you never hear it's a two defensive tackle system, right? <laughs> the back. hell you had to coin a phrase, two quarterback system, because in theory, it misguides you. In theory, it makes you think something grander than it is. But in practice, it actually was something that was smart. It was intelligent. Taking advantage of who one play Trey is. He comes in. He's a firecracker. He's the spice of what they need to do. I like it as long as it's in these limited doses. 100% agree. Is it my turn? Can I yeah, go? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't you don't, want to take you don't have to ask on this show. It's not like Colin's show. No, I don't I, have, you don't have to ask permission to speak. Or at your um, other place where you should I'm going to stay out of this. I'm new. <laughs> um, so I 100% agree. The most important thing and being in two quarterback systems, whether it's been with Brad Smith, Tim Tebow, there has to be clear, defined roles, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think Shanahan knows, and I think, um, you know, internally they know, but he's trying to keep it like this disguise thing mm. because we had him in the production meeting the night before, and he was kind of like, yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, if Trey needs to play, he'll, tra he'll play. Mm. Uh, and everybody's like, well, is it Jimmy's team or is it Trey's team, you know? And it's Jimmy's team until it's not. Mm -hmm. So they have somebody who hasn't been consistent enough in Trey Lance to just – jump Jimmy G and take the starting job, right? And be the quarterback that can run deep play action shots and check it down right away when it's not there. He's, he's looking downfield a little too long in the preseason, for my opinion. Mm -hmm. Then you can use him to figure out what the defense is doing. Are you going to play him like a Wildcat guy? Yeah. Are you worried about read option and all our tricky stuff that we got with our fly motion, mm -hmm. with our reads, with our, uh, you know, our motion to our counters and pullers and all that? Or are you going to treat him like a drop-back quarterback? And now we are going to run all that stuff that I know how to do because I coach Robert Griffin yep. in Washington. Mm. So he's in the driver's seat, and all he wanted to do is sprinkle a little bit of it in there, and now every defensive coordinator's on notice. There it is. What's your plan for Trey Lance? Here is my problem, though, fellas. <laughs> Sanchez. So, what, starts, what starts as a sprinkle, mm. right, it eventually turns into an overdose. Uh-oh. Right? Um, uh -oh. My, my dilemma uh -oh. is this. My dilemma uh -oh. is this. So yeah, I'm about to say. Uh, I'm, so, I'm talking I'm cupcakes, y'all. Now I'm I know talking, why you don't drink. I'm talking <laughs> cupcakes. Okay. All right. Um, look, if it was like Chris Leak, Tim Tebow, Florida, first time they won the chip, I love it. Two-quarterback system. That's not a two-quarterback system. Leak, you get me from the 20 to the 20, Tebow. You come in, give me a jump pass, touchdown, we're great. Yeah. But here's the dilemma. Trey Lance is still a first-round pick. And you got to honor him as a first-round pick. Let's talk our old team, Philadelphia Eagles. Sell, we watched it a lot last year. Carson Wentz, he's a guy. We know he's the man. Jalen Hurts, second-round pick, we're not going to use him much. First week of the season, Jalen Hurts was inactive. Second week of the season, Jalen Hurts was out there at wideout. No big deal, he was a decoy. Third week of the season, Jalen Hurts took his first snap. He ran his own read option. Yep. Fourth week of the season, Jalen Hurts threw his first pass. By the 12th week of the season, Jalen Hurts was a starting quarterback. Mm. And there was a whole bunch of drama, and the team eroded from the inside out. Why? Because a little bit of sex appeal from Jalen Hurts. <laughs> He's younger. He's healthier. He can run. Oh, my gosh, I like that. I feel both of y'all, in the event Kyle Shanahan can just – Stay chill. Okay, that's fine. We're fine. We're just going to play with the one quarterback system and sprinkle in a little bit of Trey. But I just think Sanchez, Sell, it's hard to fight that feeling of, man, but he went in and threw a touchdown on his first play. Before Jimmy did. I, I, before Jimmy did. I, I got to yeah, see more. I got to see more. It's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, but you know Sanchez. Oh, my God. I love me some Acho and some takes, but some of them are just cool. <laughs> you got to watch Acho on his takes. You got to always flip the coin over. He's the king of omission, as oh, I call him. Uh -oh. cool, right? Okay, so here's the thing. He just gave you the example of Jalen Hurst and Carson yes, Wentz, sir? and he just admitted one thing, that Carson Wentz was having a historically bad season, so yeah, up, yeah, the sprinkle turned into an overdose because everybody was trying to get high because they were watching Carson Wentz <laughs> not play well. Here's the thing about this situation. Jimmy GQ is a winner. If healthy, he's got to be your starter. If yeah. healthy, he has to get 93% of the team snaps as he did in week one. And I am not scared of what I'm seeing from Trey Lance just yet. I love the concept of Trey Lance, and I love actually now how Kyle Shanahan is using him as a decoy in your mind yep. as an opponent. You're going to now dedicate practice time 
practicing what he can do. True. But then once you take a deep breath and realize, oh, all he's going to do is run the football. Three rushes, one pass. One pass was a touchdown. But that's what we saw from him in the preseason. He's not ready to be a pocket passer just yet. Whatever you want to say about it. The fact that he threw so few times in college and now he's in this position with a winner as a starter, there's no way they're going to insert him in a heavy dosage. It's going to be like this, very limited until they could trust him yeah. in the pocket. Let he, gets me, to, he gets to learn and he gets the letter, mm -hmm. okay? That's huge. Yeah, That's yeah, huge yeah. for a young guy. And in the Niners' defense, they kicked the tires on Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. They got involved in the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes until that turned sour. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of baggage that Jimmy has to deal with coming into the season. Then they draft your eventual replacement, trading up nine spots, giving away three first-rounders. So Jimmy's entering the season with all this noise, and he still has to say the right thing, do the right thing, and all that. So he's handling it well. That's just tough yeah. to plan her. But they did it because Jimmy's either feast or famine, right? right? He's been, hey, we pay you a bunch of money, ACL, gone. Boom, healthy the next year, Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Next year, 10 games. Last year, 10 games gone. Ankle injury. So what do they do? They need someone who's available, right? Your best ability, availability. availability yeah. So they're, they're hedging their bet, and they're letting them learn and letter under Jimmy G, who's a great quarterback to tutor. We talked about this yesterday, though, Sanchez, and I'll fill you in. Um, sure. Sel brought up a great point, which is everything is all good until you really face the trial. Until, until it you ain't. Really, until it ain't. <laughs> Everything's all good until it ain't. Now, let's keep in mind, I know you really, you call NFL games, so I'm going to steer you clear of making hard take opinions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, when I'm forecasting. <laughs> uh, project. Um, but the Detroit Lions, based upon what you know in your film study, they're probably not a top 10 football team. No. Right, we all know that. They're going to take some years. Okay. They lost their top five cornerback, Jeff Okuda, from Ohio State, drafted last year to an Achilles injury, a lower leg injury, I believe, for the season. So it's not like the Niners really saw a mm. stout no. defense. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to put in Trey Lance because Jimmy G, to Marcellus's point, point, he balled. But big dog. You got to face the Eagles on the road. I don't think that's a huge test, but you got to fly coast to coast. And after that, you got to go against the Packers. They will be an angry Green Bay Packers, and Aaron Rodgers is always upset when he plays the 49ers no because they passed up against him. Yeah. I don't think this plays out in all kumbaya holding hands for much longer mm. because eventually you sitting there with Jimmy, with, with Trey Lance over your shoulder, the second Jimmy G airs, that's when I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the second Jimmy G airs, that's when I think, you know what? We got Trey Lance. Why don't we use him? I mean, first snap of the game, he fumbled the ball, right? Mm -hmm. Hello. Dude, it feels like <laughs> Jimmy just has to get that one play out, like mm -hmm. that one kind of bonehead, knucklehead play out, and then he, he looks great. I mean, he was, he was awesome after that. And you're right. It's just a lot to deal with. The in a, hey, I get you a first down, you know, on, on third and seven. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Trey Lance to come run. If the run gets stuffed now, I get a second and ten and then maybe a third and long. Mm. Like, as a quarterback, I've dealt with that. Are that they, sucks. Are they setting him up? Here's the biggest thing. There's, are they setting him up for failure? Because I think I heard you talk about it on the broadcast. Jimmy like, G? Yes. Mm. You, you, you talked about this all off season. Yeah. You draft a replacement, Sal. Yep. Not only you draft a replacement, now Jimmy G in the preseason is trying to run dudes over just to get into the end zone and show that he really wants it. That. He's doing yeah. that. Yeah. If, you're the, if you're the guy, you don't do that. You don't do that. But Jimmy G, it, it's a different mental makeup. And I love the fact that he is subscribing to that mental makeup. Yes. He's auditioning for his next job, and he already knows that. 100%. So he's like an ambassador right now. You're not getting the full, authentic Jimmy G. You're getting, I'm a leader. I'm projecting greatness to everyone because when I am healthy, I am a great player by the wins. However, you're not going to get the real feeling of Jimmy G. He thinks right now that they are undermining him, and it's unfair. However, you know what he also benefited from? The fact that it was unfair after seven games, you become the highest paid player in NFL history. Mm -hmm. So guess ways. what? You're, it goes both ways. He's playing with house money. That's why Jimmy G will be even killed this entire year. Yeah. He is not set up for failure. He's just setting himself up for success, and he just knows it's going to be somewhere else. Coming up, we have to ask former USC star Mark Sanchez the real about the school's decision to mm. fire Clay Help. Don't get spicy. That's next. <laughs> no more alumni free tickets for you. <laughs> Man. This weekend on Fox, start Saturday strong with the big noon kickoff pregame show at 10 Eastern. Live from North, then a noon Eastern, Nebraska takes on third rank Oklahoma. Huge big noon Saturday begins at 10 Eastern. Fox Fox Sports app. There's big news in college football. USC said they needed a, quote, change in leadership. Fired head coach Clay Helton Monday. 
The move came two days after their upset loss at home to Stanford. Ugh. Helton was 46 24 as a Trojan head coach and won the Rose Bowl in 2016. Mark, you were a star at USC. Star everywhere. Shoot, good Lord. I remember seeing him in college. I was like, I'm in the league. Why are you more famous than me? Oh, I ain't going right, to tell you, Russell. You remember, bro, like, dude was what? GQ's number one? Uh, like, no, most, yeah, you you forget, no, like, you talking about magazines. I'm talking about real life. Like, hey, I'm over here, lady. I'm uh, both. Uh, <laughs> what was your reaction, superstar, to Clay Hilton being fired? <laughs> Oof. It's never a good feeling. I mean, Clay's one of the best. I'm, You know me. I'm, I'm a USC guy. I'm not going to. I'm not going to crush the guy. Not the best record, uh, but you know what I thought he did do is he provided stability in unstable times. So last year, I mean, people, there were rumblings, right? A year ago, two years ago, hey, we need something new. We need something new. Well, maybe nobody knew what that was going to look like. And in 2020, having a new coach, I don't know if that would have helped them hmm. in recruiting or anything else. So he provided stability, also won a Rose Bowl. So listen, I'm not going to bash the guy. He was great for the players. Um, but listen, they're going in a different direction. And now it's uh, from everybody I've talked to there. It's going to be a three month full nationwide college NFL search. Mm. I mean, they're going they're going to exhaust every option. I don't know if they're going to hire an outside firm or not, but I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's pointing to Luke Fickle mm -hmm. because of Mike Bones relationship with him at Cincinnati. He hired him there. I don't know if that's the answer. Some people are saying Mario Cristobal. Some people are saying uh, Biennemi, mm -hmm. Eric Biennemi. That'd be mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Bishop Amat, L.A. guy. Yep. That'd be big. Uh, but right now for Dante Williams, he's got his work cut out for him, and he's got 10 games to audition for a head coaching job or as a holdover because he's such a great recruiter. So whoever comes in has to have an L.A. presence and keep these recruits from leaving California. Man, now that he's gotten his politically correct oh, take. Boy. Yeah, yeah, he got the other way. Your tickets are safe. Way. Your tickets are safe. Well, at least half of them, because yeah, we're going to yeah. come back to you. We're back to you. <laughs> we'll see. You're only going to have one. Sorry, little DJ. <laughs> um, he has to go solo. Um, okay, let's call the spade a spade. Let's go. Welcome to this show, baby. We don't do that. Welcome up here. to speak for yourself. <laughs> um, it's Woo. not Helton's fault, it's the program's fault. Let's go. Why can I say that? Because I've been at a program, an alumni at the University of Texas, where I realized. It's not necessarily the coach's fault. It's the program's fault. I think that USC present day is paying for the greatness of USC former days, when Sanchez was there, when Reggie was there, when Lineit was there, et cetera. Why do I say this and why am I going to break this down for everybody, though you may already know this? When the program starts to precede the players, it's all bad. USC players, I would assume like Texas players, I would assume like Cowboys players for our NFL fans, they show up. And they already hot, baby. Oh, my God, you play at USC? Oh, my God, you're a cowboy? Oh, you play at Texas? Yes. You show up and you already that dude. So you don't have to put in the work to actually earn becoming that person. USC tried hiring a brilliant football mind in Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin's a brilliant football mind. Say what you will. Oh, yeah. Moved on from him. Which you. you hire another brilliant football mind in Sark. Obviously, Sark had his off-the-field issues at that time. Didn't work out. Moved on from him. Now you hire a phenomenal human being in Clay Helton. I can't speak to his football brilliance, but a phenomenal human being by everyone who speaks of him. Didn't work out. So it didn't work out for a brilliant football mind. And it didn't work out for a brilliant person. So who's it going to work out for? Again, I just say be careful what you wish for. Clay Helton won 10 games. Clay Helton won 11 games. Mm. You're going to keep chasing something and you might not ever catch it. So he, he has Wileyisms. Now, what you'll realize about a Wileyism is not actually anything he actually said. He took it from somebody Top else. Compliment or backhanded? He recoined it I'm and he claims it as his own. Wow. A little bit. A little bit. One of my favorite <laughs> Wileyisms that Cell said is. Um, the person who had it good oh. and wanted it better mm -hmm. made it worse. Mm -hmm. The person who had it good and wanted it better made it worse. I've, so seen, a, that. I've seen that on a pop. I know you have. <laughs> he didn't make it up. I saw it in a fortune cookie. It's not Marcellus Wiley. But okay, let me let me let me put put a bow on this and I'm gonna pass it to my dog. Okay. The person who had it good and wanted it better made it worse. Mm. Mac Brown. They fired him after going nine and four and eight and five. You hire Charlie Strong. He never saw eight or nine wins. Then you hire Tom Herman. He only saw nine wins one time. Fired him. Now you hired Coach Sark. Mm. Person who had it good and wanted it better made it worse. Mm. USC, 
Hire Lane Kiffin. He saw 10 wins one time. Then you hire Sark. He wasn't there very long. You hire Clay Helton. He saw 10 wins once. He saw 11 wins once. I get it. You're USC. Your expectations are so incredibly high. But just remember, you had it good. You want to make it better. You might <laughs> just make it worse. I don't think it's Helton's fault. I think it's the program's fault. I'm going to dive in more later. Okay, yeah, we got to dive in oh more later. A lot of questions there. Um, I think you guys need a little help in your takes uh -oh. right here. Because uh -oh. I'm looking at USC, and I can feel it tugging at your heartstrings. And then I'm looking at University of Texas big football. And I think you guys need an outside perspective, an Ivy League small school <laughs> okay. perspective, 3,000 people in the stands perspective. Because <clears throat> I don't think you guys can see the forest for the trees. Here's the thing. This move by USC to go to Clay Helton was an intentional pivot for economics. This was an intentional pivot in perception. This was an intentional pivot because of the ethics. You guys got caught up in so much success, and then Pete Carroll leaves, and obviously what happens with Reggie Bush and the sanctions, and the next thing you know, it's starting to snowball on USC in terms of perception. Yep. Now, perception is not reality. You have the indiscretion here, indiscretion here, but USC... This is not only a story program, but it's a prestigious university. And they want to protect their brand. So this is what happens. They say, nah, nah, we've been doing too well on that football field. Let's do it. So then they go out there and they go get Sark. Now, Sark did highs and lows, and then he was gone after the second season. Then they said, damn, they're starting to contemplate. Do we make the full pivot? I'm going to tell you about the pivot soon. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let's go football again, football again. Lane Kiffin comes in, has his highs, has his lows. Then they said, you know what, let's go full pivot. And you know what they say, never go full pivot. Because uh, <laughs> once you go full pivot, you can't go back. They go to the better person. Not necessarily the better football mind or coach, but the better person. Let me tell you why they did this pivot. I went to an Ivy League school. And in the Ivy League in 1982, uh, we dropped from being big time like you guys. You know we won the Rose Bowl in 1934, right? We dropped from being big time. Shut up. We went from <laughs> big time, and we, had, we got forced, basically, by the NCAA to go to FCS 1AA. But now let's talk about the economics, the ethics, and why the pivot is necessary. Ten universities with the biggest endowments. Y'all ready for this? See, it's funny. Football... On the football field in college, is just like football in the pros. The players are rich. The owners are wealthy. Mm -hmm. Just like in college, programs that have great athletics are rich. The ones that have great academics are wealthy. Top 10 schools in endowments. This is the money. Harvard, one. Yale, two. Princeton, three. Stanford, four. Northwestern, MIT, Columbia. Y'all getting the point? The point is this. They chasing dough now. They're going to get nice guys. Y'all can keep talking about all these guys that can help. Oh, he's from L.A. Oh, he's a great player, and now he's a coach. I swear, USC realized we're losing out not only in the money game economically, but in the ethics game because of all the indiscretions of yesterday. So being fired at USC, yeah, he has to go. He's not proper for your branding. You guys are losing recruit after recruit. But the point is, I see why USC made this move. We'll see if they stay committed to that pivot. That's fair. My only thing is the endowment, like if I'm a recruit at 18 years old, what I don't even know what endowment means. <laughs> like, you know who does? The one who's accepting that same recruit. Yes, but not the, <laughs> but not the ballers that are leaving. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, and here's my other thing. You know, high tide raises all ships. Mm -hmm. yeah. When football's good there, everything's good there. Winning cures, covers a lot of wards, True. just like in the NFL. Mm. They need a guy that's going to come in, keep these recruits in California. Right now, California's open for business yeah. because all these SEC teams are coming. Look at the top five schools in the country have – Quarterbacks from, like, California, mm -hmm. Arizona, or two from Orange <laughs> County. Mm -hmm. These kids from Orange County are leaving here, going to places that they can't. Tuscaloosa, Alabama? He couldn't point that place out on a map. I guarantee you he couldn't. <laughs> Same thing with uh, Big Cinco over in uh, Uyungle <laughs> Lake yep. at Clemson. He doesn't know where that is. No <laughs> chance he knew where that was. So now it's, it's a matter of these private flights coming in from the SEC, going to see 20 high schools, and all this. They've shrunk the world with, with Twitter, mm -hmm. with Instagram. Now they can talk to these kids. Mm. Before, they just had a wall up around California, and it was like, don't come here. It's a waste of your time. I think the problem now, though, we got to be real, man. And I think Texas fans have had to come to this realization. Michigan fans had to come to the realization sooner. SC fans might be having to come to this realization. Your program's not as good as you thought it was. <laughs> oh, that's what you're doing? Your program's not as good, at least, as it was. Well, well spade a spade. Okay. Like, Michigan fans had to come to that realization 
first, mm. right? Like, mm. wait a second. Okay, mm. we ain't won a national championship in a long time. Texas fans fighting that realization. We bobbing and weaving it. Ali in his prime. Just, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? rope a Because Texas fans are, you know, you won 10 games for maybe 13 seasons straight, the whole Mac Brown era until his last few years. And then SC fans, it's kind of like, I don't even know if the job is still a sexy job. Whoa, whoa. Why whoa. do I say that? Chill. Why? Because what is, I say, I say that I have achoism. I just don't use them nearly as often. <laughs> mine are actually creative. I come up with mine. Um, my, my, my achoisms. It's kind of like expectation minus reality equals disappointment. Mm. The expectations at USC are so high. They should be in the college football playoffs. They should make it to an national championship game. But the reality is, y'all won the Pac-12 South three times USC has since Pete Carroll left. So that's why there's so much disappointment. Y'all firing a dude who's 42 and 24. That's not that bad. Let's not get it twisted. 42 and 24 is not bad. You're right. But at SC it is. Yeah. Well, winning yeah, 10 games and winning 11 games is not bad. But at Texas, at Ohio State, Notre Dame, Florida, Bingo. all those schools. Bingo, yeah. It's a not winning 10 games is not an option. Like, that's just not okay. Okay, can we go here? Can I go, can I go somewhere? And I mean, where are you going? Because y'all everywhere right now, let's go. Pac-12. Let me, it's an let, easier path to let, the playoffs. Let, let me, I'm going to get you, Sanchez. Let me, let me go oh, here. Let me go here. Let me, let me ruffle <laughs> some feathers if I can. Since the 2000s, there's really only five elite college football coaches. I like Dabo Sweeney, Nick Saban, Bob Soups, Urban Meyer, hmm. Mac Brown. Outside of those five generational coaches, ain't nobody else really just winning chips. Coach O, he snuck one in. Gus Malzahn, Auburn, he snuck one in. But they had generational talents. Cam Newton, at quarterback. Jameis Winston, college quarterback. The thing is, SC, who y'all chasing? That generational talent? <clears throat> Outside of Stoops, Brown, Urban, Dabo, Saban, nobody else is really getting them. But that's every generation. Yeah. But the I problem, mean, there's four yeah. or five guys so that... Then what's SC to do? That run the table. Uh, are they well, well, care about money? Are they to only go in on sales points? Well, like, look how they got Pete Carroll. He wasn't the first choice. No. It, they, everybody dogged them in L.A. They didn't want Pete Carroll. Everybody was pissed. Donations went down. Endowment was low. That's but the point. He brought him back. He was a fired NFL coach twice. Yeah. And then brought him out of the ashes. To come up and rise from the ashes, something's got to burn. Man, it, it's just sad Sanchez to see. Sanchezism. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. That sounds Markism, please. I like Sanchez, but Sanchez is another. Um, <laughs> you guys are chasing your highlights, and your highlights are obviously behind uh, you, and that's a tough place. Look, when you're retired from the football, the, to me, the scariest moment is, are my highlights behind me in life, or are they going to be in front of me? For point. me, I obviously took the leap of faith, just like you guys. There's going to be greater moments ahead. Many guys... They're scared. They're struggling because they think their highlights are behind them. That's what USC program looks like. I didn't know this about you, Mark, but I just figured out that you'd rather be more famous than rich because you <laughs> over here defending this school. <laughs> what? This school has made a choice. They want to be rich. They want to be wealthy. They don't want to be just famous saying, oh, we got this great football program that gets us in trouble, doesn't get us as much money, but hey, it's good for the brand. I don't know how that adds up economically. Let me tell you what y'all did. I know this because I was going to go to UCLA coming out of high school. And I was looking at USC. I wasn't good enough. I'll be real about it. I wasn't that good to go to USC. I've noticed that you guys have intentionally, and this is smart, lowered the acceptance rate. Columbia does this. And then you raise the tuition. Columbia does that as well. And you know what that does in perception? Makes the school more exclusive, prestigious. Yeah. Sure. And now you make more money. I don't understand why people don't get this. USC is doing better now than it was when you guys were out there winning all those games. It's just you guys are just I, locked up into this football think, world of force. Because it doesn't matter. Texas got blown out by Arkansas this week. Blown out. We got crushed. 40 to 21. My alma mater. Mm. And I'm sitting here trying to rationalize it, right? Because people are clowning us. We lost to a lower tier SEC team. Mm. Texas, no way they can make it in the top tier of the SEC schools. So, I take to Twitter. My little Twitter fingers. Oh boy. I take to Twitter. I'm like, yo, <laughs> The move from Texas to the SEC was a financial move. We there all know go. that. Anybody no with common sense knows it's a no financial move. Now we're talking. The problem is, fans don't want to hear that. They don't. Players don't want to hear that. Nobody cares, Sell, about endowments when you're talking about the big dog. <laughs> we don't care about endowments. Yeah. We care about winning national yeah, yeah, championships. Yeah, yeah, I only care about millions, not billions. Forget that. Okay. This is just being real. The SEC got this problem, too. One, they're out the football game right now. When Clay Helton was hired, there were other football minds they could have chose over him. They chose the 
glorified executive assistant of coaching. He's an offensive mind who didn't even call plays, right? Graham Harrell's out there calling plays for him. He's just making sure everything. He's a glorified manager in that role to make sure the brand is protected. But Chip, Chip Kelly's here now. Y'all noticed that, right? And Chip Kelly, when he was in Oregon, used to poach L.A. All Chip Kelly did was say, I need a flight to L.A. I need a flight to Hawaii. And trust me, Oregon going to be fine. And Oregon was fine. Now he's here. He's taking all the players that are local unless they go to the top programs elsewhere. Four to five top teams in college football have quarterbacks all from here, as you spoke of. Y'all out the football game. I, you know that pill y'all chewing on? Swallow it. <laughs> USC has swallowed it. Their next hire, guarantee it right now. Won't be this football guy. Won't be this brilliant mind that can restore the program. It's going to be somebody to protect the program. You just got to accept that. You guys okay? No. Right. <laughs> y'all did it for a while. Now Sark is back. We'll see if it adds up. We'll get it right. Not after last week, though. Good Lord, <laughs> y'all got tilted. Coming up, the Raiders had a big win last night. Welcome to the Ivy League, y'all. But we'll tell you if that means they'll take the next step this year. That's next on Speak for Yourself. That's where the money's at. You up, y'all? <laughs> I didn't know, y'all. Let's head to Las Vegas. All right, so <laughs> where the Raiders pulled off a stunner last night against the Ravens. Derek Carr finished with over 400 passing yards, had two touchdown passes, including the game winner in overtime. John Gruden, Chucky, said after the exciting finish, quote, felt like I died and woke up and died again. I was like a cat. I had multiple lives tonight. Mm -hmm. So I choked. Will the Raiders take the next step this year? I think they will, but what is the next step? Last year, they went 8-8. Eight and eight. The year before, they went 7-9. and nine. John Gruden's first year, they went 4-12. and 12. That was three years ago. So the next step for me is having a winning record. Not a 500 record, not a below 500 record. But remember, in this day and age of the NFL, with an extra game sale, mm. the next step still might not be good enough. I think the next step is a wild card spot. They were okay. three games out of the playoffs last year. I think this year they might be a game or two out. So if the next step is a wild card spot, I think they'll get closer, but they still won't make it into the playoffs. Mm. Why will they get closer? Because those two teams that will really have to jostle with them, in my mind, the Tennessee Titans, Indianapolis Colts, it appears they've taken half steps or full steps back. Mm. Raiders appear to have taken a half step mm. or full step forward. Y'all do the math. Half step back, half step forward, it'll equate to a next step. But just because you won a game last night in overtime off a couple of fluke type of things, Lamar Jackson fumbles twice in the last three possessions, I'm not convinced that that means they're really about to take that next playoff formidable opponent step. The other problem is... Everything in life is in comparison. Ah, I love to doing the show with you. Everything. It's a I relative promise. existence, my brother. I love doing this show with Cell because I can really talk. And things that would typically talk nerdy, Cell won't even <laughs> bat an eye. I love it. Um, I might have been listening to an Einstein interview, an Einstein book, an Albert Einstein something. Mm. And he said, if an object is falling, right, if an object out of a building is falling, how could you not be able to tell it was falling? You have to be going at the same speed yes. as it. Yes. You're falling at the same speed yes. as the object yes. or everything else, else is falling in congruence with the object. Yes. That's the only time an object in motion will appear at rest right. if everything else is falling with it or you are falling with it. Mm -hmm. The Raiders are in motion. Uh -huh. and who else is in motion? Mm. Talk. Chargers. Talk that talk. They're also in motion within go. the same division. So go. while the object, the, Oak, the Las Vegas Raiders are in motion, well, the Chargers are also in motion, and they might be in motion at the exact same rate. So typically, an object in motion you can tell. But like Einstein says, an object in motion appears to be in motion unless there's another object in motion at the same time at that simultaneous speed. So mm. the Raiders might take a next step. But if the Chargers take that step with the Raiders, we won't notice the step that the Raiders just took. Great point, great point. Um, just to add to that before I get into my take, there are eight undefeated AFC teams right now. Eight. Eight are not getting into the playoffs, correct? So we got a problem right there. And all of them in their division won. The AFC West and NFC West, West side, West side is the best side, have all undefeated teams right now. So teams are progressing as well as the Raiders. No, the Raiders won't take the next step this year. Now, I think they were given an opportunity to take the next step in terms of record because they were given another game. So guess what? 
The Raiders won't be 8-8 eight eight this year. Impossible. They'll be 9-8. and eight. And that's what's it. That next step, 9-8, and eight, is not going to get them into the postseason. That's going to be sad, too, because who doesn't want to see Steve Aoki in the playoffs DJing? That was major. That's big. I'll get to that stadium later. Let's talk about why they won't take the next step. Because it doesn't add up right now. One thing I learned about coaches reading it, and one thing I learned from experiencing my NFL career with coaches is this. They all need a philosophy. Like, to walk into a building and really command attention, you need a philosophy. Pete Carroll always talks about this. But more important than a philosophy, you need to have a program that your players buy into and that is reliable. Reliability is understated in the NFL. What does that mean? The way that we want to win, we actually win that way. And if not, we got problems. Because even in a successful game, a game you win, but you look at it, you say, we can't replicate that. We can't do that every week. And that's a problem looking at the Raiders right now. I saw the Raiders go out there and have the most pressure against the opponent's quarterback of all teams in week one. That includes Chandler Jones in Arizona. And they still were in a dogfight down in the fourth quarter. Okay. Whatever. They had the most total yards, most passing yards in a passing league and still were down in the fourth quarter. And we're down in the fourth quarter and was going to lose the game. But then Lamar Jackson decided not to have ball security, not to be in love with the most important thing on that field. And it's not his legs and it's not his arm. It's that damn leather. It's that ball. So he gave them the game. That said, I look at the Raiders and I'm like, where are they going to find repeatable success the way that they designed it after this game. Now, people say, it's just one game. So, hold on. I'm supposed to take the benefits of this one game. Y'all won. Y'all beat the Ravens, but not take the L's and the liabilities that came from that game. So, I look at last year. I look at last year when they had a losing record against playoff teams. I look at them in the AFC last year where they were just 500. I don't think they take the next step. And if they do, as you said, as Einstein said, other teams are taking the step with them including the Houston, Texas. We'll figure that out. Yeah, I mean, remember last year, right? The Raiders were 8-8. Eight and eight. The Dolphins were 10-6. and six. Both those teams missed the playoffs. The cutoff for the playoffs was the Browns at 11-5. and five. So, Raiders, y'all got to look around, man. Look around. Chiefs, I don't think they're going to get worse. Bills, yeah, they took L to the Steelers, but I don't think they're going to get significantly worse. No, Steelers no. made the playoffs last year. Ravens made the playoffs last year. Titans, Colts, Browns, Dolphins. The only team, if you're a Raider, who you can look at and say, we, we might be able to snipe them dudes. You might be able to clinch the heel of the Titans. Mm. You might be able to clinch the heel of the Colts. But the Titans are in a bad division as it is. Yeah. Out there playing with them Texans, out there playing. Like, so one of them teams going to make the playoffs. I'm with you, Sal. Like, the Raiders will improve. Henry Ruggs, second round, second over, second year in the league, first round pick. He appears to have taken a a step. Brian Edwards, second year in the league, third round pick. Nice. Appears to have taken a step. Big step. Like, the Raiders' skill players are doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. First round pick, Josh Jacobs from a couple years back. He's balling now. If Ruggs and Edwards, first and third round pick, are balling, they're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Hard. Quarterback, finally balling once again. He's going to be all right. The problem is... This AFC, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it might be the AFC of old. Mm. Remember back in the gap, like Peyton Manning, Tom yeah, Brady's yeah. Yeah, 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 AFC, yeah. even when Phillip Rivers had the Chargers consistently winning 10 to 12 games. Mm-hmm. Like, it appears the AFC is just such a gauntlet that Raiders, y'all might take a step, but y'all need to take leaps and bounds, and I don't know if y'all going to take any bounds forward. Yeah, and if you keep up here, talking about Derek Carr wasn't balling the last two he years. Wasn't Sal. Hundred quarterback rating, hundred one quarterback rating. Who balling then? If no Pro Bowls, but I mean, no Pro Bowls. He made the Pro Bowl three was, years. Was Baker right? Mayfield balling last year? He was doing all right. <laughs> no, 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 no Pro Bowls, no Pro Bowls. See, you know what I'm saying? We can't do it both ways like that. Here's the thing. Raiders, y'all going to improve. Raiders' problem is other teams are improving too. Raiders' problem is some teams we ain't even think we're going to be good are good. We keep talking about the Colts and Titans. They looking up to the Texans right now. Tyrod Taylor is not going to mess it up. He may not be the highest ceiling quarterback you love, but he is not going to mess it up. And if he continues with that team full of some vets, they can do something special. Now let's talk about the stadium. Let's talk about the theatrics of it. Because I'm looking at that stadium, and I got mixed reviews on that. But I want to hear what you think first so I don't take your opinion. For me, the dope part was very simple. One, I like the shots. My dog Charles Wilson in there at the box without. I love like, that. It just seemed like Sipping it was a vibe. That. The dudes were there. George Lopez was out there. Like, mm. if you are bringing out stars and you will bring out fans, Vegas that every is week. why I'm rocking with them. I'm still rocking with SoFi. Better looking um, stadium yes. by Still far. Still rocking with so far. By far. But I do think the Raiders, given that they just moved, I think they got some cooking. 
Okay, I'm glad I did listen to you because I'm going to take a little off my fastball. Because I was looking at that stadium like, all right, bare bones, that stadium is built and SoFi is built. That looked like the, the, the apartment you get out of college, right? And then you go to SoFi, you're like, oh, I finally got a good job. It's like, like, SoFi is so much more beautiful than that stadium. I'm not letting you in. That stadium dusty. But it's, it, they got 1999 Tennessee new stadiums. The screens, they ain't even got the loop. They ain't got the Jerry World. They ain't got the loop. Like so, the, you don't want to be allowed. No, no, I'm go- Raider fans know I hate them, <laughs> so I'm gonna be in the building. No, amazing. Looking at the setup, the amenities, it's crazy. Like you said, the energy is next level. Always had deep respect for the black hole. They're gonna get a boost from that as well. They know that they're playing in front of fans and special players and people. At the same time, sorry, some other teams at AFC that's gonna get y'all coming up. Julio Jones was called out by his coach, Mike Grable, Monday. Hold up, that can't be improper. Let me say that again. <laughs> what? <laughs> we'll tell you if we have an issue with that. You think? Oh, speak for yourself. The Titans were blown out Sunday by the Arizona Cardinals, but a moment in the first quarter is being called out. Now, star receiver Julio Jones got a 15-yard unnecessary roughness penalty that resulted in a Titans punt. Head coach Mike Grable was asked about it Monday, and boy, he did not hold back. Y'all take a listen. Mm critical mistake you know I don't think that you know, those, those are absolutely that's that's absolutely nothing that that we coach or teach um, you know so that would fall into the category of doing dumb <laughs> that hurts the team uh, right there uh, in bold letters it goes from third and one to third and 16 sheesh coach calm down spicy <laughs> You got an issue, man, with the head coach calling out future Hall of Famer by any metric, Julio Jones? Hell yeah, I got an issue with this. Mike Vrabel know I love that dude. We came out the same year, did all the combine work and the all-star work. That's my dog, but damn, already? Julio Jones? Oh, it's a little... A little early in the season, let's say week one, to go that high up the food chain in terms of trying to get some discipline in order. And coaches always do this. And coaches are usually smarter than this. They find the highest ranking player, but not so high that you can potentially lose your team. And they find the highest ranking player, not the highest, and try to reprimand that guy to send a message. But you usually don't go all the way up to the top of the food chain where Derrick Henry is, (laughs) and then right under him is Julio Jones. I'm sorry, Ryan Tannehill. This should have happened to Ryan Tannehill, not Julio Jones, because reputation precedes Julio Jones. In case of emergency, you break glass and there's a Julio Jones. There's not a situation where right now you're breaking that glass. This is not an emergency. You got rolled in week one. Like Aaron Rodgers said, just one game. Relax, coach. But you know what's funny about this? Now, let's talk deep. And I don't want to take you off your your take, but this is something that a lot of executives and people in power always fear about having former players in position of Mm -hmm. power. You know why? When you get a former player in a position of power, as they say, you got to dust them off a little bit. They got a lot of locker room on them, right? So Mike Vrabel is just a former player who's like, yo, we keep it real. When we play in the locker room, we keep it real. Julio Jones, meet someone who used to play the game just like you. And that's that BS he's saying. But coaches usually clean it up. The non-former players, they kind of clean it up. And I don't know, I'm a little torn on this one because the former player in me loves the fact that he was authentic. But damn, it's too soon to be going that high up and grabbing Julio. So I don't have an issue with it because I don't think most coaches do this to make an example. Remember Bruce Arians, head coach for the Bucks last year. Tom Brady made some mistakes calling out Tom Brady, in my mind, unnecessarily. And I think he was doing that inauthentically. I think he was trying to make a calculated example. If I shoot at Brady, y'all know I can shoot at you. I think Vrabel's just keeping it 100. Vrabel's a former defensive player under Bill Belichick former team captain under Bill Belichick, and team captains don't have any sort of favoritism. Mm. Team captains mm. just call spades spades, <clears throat> especially within their team. Mm. That's the mindset I think Brable has. He don't care that Julio Jones might be a future Hall of Famer. He cares that they traded a lot for Julio Jones, mm. and Julio Jones only had, what, 29 or so passing reception yards that game? Yep, three catches, 29. Three catches for 29. So he's looking around like, Bum. you can get it to you. Because what was you? You ain't show up. 
Um, I believe the other thing is yeah, okay, he got I smacked, think. bro. He okay. got smacked. You know yep. how coaches is. Like, yeah, yeah. He took a loss this bad once last year yeah, against yeah. the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. He's not used to getting, getting embarrassed mm. like this. Mm. And so he's going to the presser, probably a little bit heated, and he's just talking because he's hot. Realistically, I don't even think it was a penalty. Like that, that kind of stuff happens on every play. I'm mm. surprised they even called it. Also, that didn't cost y'all the game. Like, look at the play. Yeah, you... you you mad at this? Like, Vrabel, did, did you even see it? Like, mm. I mean, sure, call it if you want to. Maybe swung at the helmet, <clears> blah, <throat> blah, but they both touch Johnson. They both out there wrestling. Now, he didn't even hit him in there. I don't know. It's just me. Mm. I think Vrabel is just being who Vrabel is. I have no issue with it. Yeah, but who Vrabel is doesn't mean that's who Vrabel needs to always display. Um, let's be real about it. And they did get Molly Wop last year, 40 to 14. Mm -hmm. He'd been there before. So don't act like you ain't. Took a L before and a capital L on top of that. I love how you talked out of both sides of your mouth just right there. You a broadcaster and a former player. You don't know who you want to be right now. All them Emmys got you confused, homeboy. Uh, there is no place in this world where you look at someone based on their status and your summation is, oh, you can get it too. Nah, B, because you and I up here get away with some stuff that somebody else who comes as a guest or someone else who comes up here it's not going to get away with, Acho. Um, I don't know anybody else who gets water during breaks. You know what I'm saying? And they ain't getting their own water. I don't know anybody else who gets what, these mixed bags of nuts you always eating and chewing on during the reads and messing them up. <laughs> but nobody checks Acho because Acho can't get it, too. You know what I'm saying, Acho? Respect that. Now, Vrabel knows that Julio Jones is a future Hall of Famer. You know what that means? Even in bad games, they respond. Get a dude a gain and respond. New system. Bad offseason. They had all kind of issues out there in Tennessee. Three for 29. I get last year Julio didn't look amazing as well. Problem is, if you want people to put respect on his name, it starts with you, coach, sure. by putting respect on his name. But be real, man. And, I'm and being real. Sound jaded Week or one? Whatever. If you're Mike Vrabel, you're looking at Julio like, who are you? You got any Super Bowls? Because Vrabel do. You're looking at Julio Jones. And who they're looking at? Who are you? They carried you. Vrabel, you, were they going to win those Super Bowls without you? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Who better, Julio or Mike Vrabel? You got Super Bowls, coach. I don't want to hear that's for all that? y'all. That ain't you. No, you talking to me, homeboy. If you Mike Vrabel, you looking at Julio Jones like, bro, you was hurt last year. I still went out on a limb for you, although he played in the majority all of right, games. Remember, right. he played injured. Right. I went out on a limb Nine for games. you as the head coach. Three, uh, 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 three catches, 29 yards. I get what you did in Atlanta. Oh, you on this. What you done here? Mm. Who are you? Mm. If you recruit somebody over from another network, that's cool you had a dope show And the first show, you're going to try to undress them just because I ain't like how you did the B-block? I'm just saying, who are <laughs> you, big dog? What have you done for me? First of all, Brable better not ever, ever, ever get his lips to say that to Julio Jones. He can say that to me. He better not say that. And he barely said it to me because he got the Super Bowls. <laughs> I'm better than you, Brable. I'm not kidding. <laughs> the Brable's a beast. Uh, here's the thing. It's, this is, let me get to your story for him. Please. Belichick, Parcells. Obviously, you know that they had their little issues. Of but they kind of learned the same thing. A lot of that was osmosis. Let's be real about it. I was with Bill Parcells 2004. Eddie George, I think he had a 10-year streak of starts at the running back position, mm -hmm. like some NFL record, right? All of a sudden... Bill Parcells was looking at Eddie George. For whatever reason, he didn't feel Eddie George. He didn't like Eddie George. He didn't like his style. He didn't like how he played. He didn't like something about Eddie George. Do you know that we went into a game and Bill Parcells' first play from scrimmage was a pass? But not just a pass, a pass where we're going to have an empty set. Like, we don't need to run it back. Broke this man's streak third down, put him in the game just like, um. And the way Tuna used to sit there was like, petty, petty, petty. I don't know if this is that level of petty, but this is that level of why, dog. You don't have to play the game that way. I understand everyone has to be accountable, but it's a way that you go about enforcing accountability. Starting at Julio Jones week one, what you going to do after that? It's only Derrick Henry left to the even problem go. problem is, in our minds, yes, but in Vrabel's mind, Vrabel's looking at it like this. I done been to the playoffs two years in a row with these horses I got. Yeah, Derrick right. Henry, Ryan Tannehill. I done been to the playoffs with my dog, A.J. Brown, at a wide receiver. We just lost our dude, Corey, to the Jets. Yeah. So I know I got some dogs, and we've won a lot of games with these dogs. I'm not going to bring you in, who's Julio Jones, and now we take the second worst loss mm. we've taken in the last 18 games, mm. and now baby you. Because mm. it's almost like, so I could do it without you. Let's flip the, the, the analogy on his head. If a co-host now comes in working with you and you already had ample success, I can't come in 
forget to do a read, do something, you're going to be looking at me like, who are you? Because I did it without you. The first show. You know the first show I would do? I would say, what you doing after the show? Come here, man. We walk into the dressing room. I would say, you know, like after we come back from commercial and that stuff in the prompter, read that. You know what I'm saying? Hey, my dog. Glad to have you here, homie. Week one. Week I don't have a problem. Go check Julio. Three catches, one game. Two catches, that's game. Four catches. Julio, what's up, dog? Now I got to undress you in front of everybody because you acting like everybody else. You're supposed to be special. But week one, that damn fast? Woo! He better... Only reason I give you some credit in that take is the fact that he's trying to build a culture. And it's a winning culture. Mm -hmm. And he's continuously trying to reinforce that. You're right. And Julio doesn't come from that winning culture to the same degree as of late. I hear some of that, but not all of that. Coming up, everybody cannot win in the NFL. We got both sides covered. Look at this. We're picking our winners and losers from week one. That's next. Don't speak for yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. It's time for our week one winners. And losers. But a quick <laughs> reminder, we're not saying anyone or anything is an actual loser. But for one week, one week only, they certainly look that way. So, Acho, Emmy, give us your losers for week one. Man, week one, my third biggest loser, unfortunately, Deshaun Watson. Mm. Okay, how Deshaun? He ain't even play. Why Deshaun? Because Terod Taylor, the backup to Deshaun Watson, who ended up starting the game, balled out. Now, Deshaun is the Texans' all-time passing leader, 269 passing yards per game. But in replacement, Terod Taylor still gave up or had 291 mm. plus 40 rushing, and mm. they won 37 to 21, although they were underdogs to the mm. Jacksonville Jaguars. Talk so Deshaun me. was actually my third biggest loser. My second biggest loser. Let's go. Couple guys. Packers management. Let's go. You gotta feel stupid as can be when you concede to all of Aaron Rodgers' complaints and demands. Okay, Aaron, we'll sign Randall Cobb. We'll give you everything you need. They signed Randall Cobb, and Cobb's only catch came from Jordan Love. Mm. So Packers management, my second biggest loser, just because they feel dumb. I would feel dumb at least. You get blown out 38-3. to Worst opening season, worst opening game loss in the last 51 years are the Green Bay Packers. Silly. But my biggest loser. Look at that. Last name starts with an L. So capital L. Taylor Lewan. Oh, golly, I can go get against him right now. It's not even my fault. I'm not even, you good. You might have three sacks up against him. I got he that. He to Twitter on his own man oh. and said that he felt dumb. Oh. He gave up a franchise oh. record of oh. five sacks oh. to Chandler Jones, oh. two forced fumbles. Now, Lawan might not have given up all five, but he might as well have. Oh, and then here's the worst part. Ooh. Here's how you know you caught an L, Sal. When you go to Twitter and you self-deprecate. Oh, yes. Like, when you go to Twitter and say, hey, y'all, I suck. I got my butt whooped, but I'll be a better man for it. <laughs> <laughs> the critics yeah. to the punt. Yeah, B you Rabbit. Know what I'm saying? Like, no hey, way Mal. around it. I let the team and the fans down. Thank you, Chan Jones, for exposing me. Like, that ain't gonna work on me and Marcellus Wiley. Hell You're not gonna no. clown yourself and think we're gonna let you off the hook. Hell no. My third man. Dog, coach was like, he's sorry right now. As we call those players, that's a limo. You give him a limo to the hotel to make sure he shows up at the game so you can butter that bread. That's all right, though. He's still a beast respond. All right, my number three loser is Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I'm going straight to my heart. Y'all know how much I love me some oh. Lamar Jackson, but yeah. I ain't never seen somebody lose twice on Monday Night Football. Good Lord. <laughs> God dang. Lamar Jackson gave the game away. Lamar, you gave the game away. Ball security, you got to fall in love with the football more than your legs, more than your escapability, and more than your arm talent. It's protecting the football. And you're out there, you fumbled it three times, and you lost it twice. Lamar, you lost a game for your team. Now my number two loser, Buffalo Bills. I told you I'm going to the heart. Not enough Buffalo sauce. Like, look at my boy, hook the wings up, and you go here. Extra crispy sauce on the side. They went out there and played a better game than Pittsburgh. Who won the game? Not them. The other team won the game. Buffalo has only lost twice at home in the last two years, and that was one this Sunday. Come on, Buffalo, do better. But my number one, <laughs> my number one loser, People like to say I like to pile on Baker Mayfield. I don't. I just point out what I see. Baker Mayfield, all that for nothing. All them passing yards, no touchdowns. All that, oh, we're going to go out there and we look good against the Chiefs. But nothing, because once again, they get caught up. 23 to 10, outscored, second half, and you saw what happened. Kansas City Chiefs, once again, victorious. Come on, Baker Mayfield, you look good to me. This is a contract moment. 
but you still got to respond. You can't be doing all that for nothing. I was about to ask you, Sal. Baker Mayfield, he didn't do great. He kind of proved himself in that mm. game, at least mm. to be a game manager. Lamar Jackson, two fumbles in pivotal moments, like you said, lost twice. Does this at all affect their contracts or small fries in the big skip game? Uh, oh, no, no, not at all, because you believe in both of those guys. Now, the difference is... Baker Mayfield is trying to prove he could be the lead dog. Like, okay, this is really going through me. That's a pivotal moment to throw an interception when you're trying to be the lead dog on a team that's built off the run. Lamar Jackson is good. He's like, without me, what are we right now in terms of the injuries, in terms of our passing game? So Lamar Jackson's fighting in a different direction. I feel you. Speaking of a different direction, let's talk about the winners, and it's only right that I present them. <laughs> yo, um, dog. Week one winners. Number three, my dog, oh. Jalen. Oh, yo, dog now. Hey, Jalen, I've been the one to pick it. Calm down. You ain't never. You, you ain't never. never. You stand okay. on the bar. <laughs> you ain't never been on his side, and now you're going to try to front for the carry. I'm sorry, Jalen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Jalen Hurts, why yeah. is he the biggest winner? Because his receiver showed up for him. Mm. The, uh, uh, my dog who won the Devontae Heisman Smith. last year, Devontae Smith. Yep. Uh, Beast, won a Heisman last year. He had a Beast. touchdown catch. Jalen Rager, first round pick last year. Nice. Touchdown catch. Showed Dallas up. Goddard, second round pick 2018. Touchdown catch. I'm happy for Hurts and he's the biggest winner because the guys around him won. 124 passer rating week one. His pass rating last year only a 77. Huge week mm. for Hurts. Mm. Second biggest winner. How about Sean Payton? Really? Why sell? Because he gambled. Nobody wanted Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston was trash. So how's that a gamble? Nobody wants you. <laughs> because he said, you know what? Don't nobody see your value. Ah, I'll see your value. I'll put you on the bench for a year. I stash you in the fridge. Mm. African households, we got two freezers. We got one in, the, one in, the, in, the, in the main house. We got one in the garage. The one in the garage, you yeah. can stash there because eventually we might need that food in the garage. Yeah. That's what Sean Payton did with Jameis Winston. <laughs> I'm not going to put you in the freezer in the house. I'm putting you in the freezer in the garage. And after uh, my dog Breeze retired, he went, he yeah. opened it up, he yeah. found a stalkfish. Stalkfish <laughs> was named Jameis. Jameis Ball, my biggest <laughs> second winner, Sean Payton. Hilarious. My number one biggest winner, though. How about that dude, Jamar Chase? Nice. Remember, yeah. they were saying he couldn't catch. Yes. He said that the Bye football up. in the NFL was different <clears throat> than the football in college. We clowned him. Mm. Then week one, 101 receiving yards. I like Franchise it. Franchise record for the Bengals in a debut. Mm. Huge moment, huge play, huge performance, yeah. and they got the win. Yeah. He's my biggest one. Man, you know I am truly Nigerian. I told you 61%, my 23andMe said, because I got two freezers too. We got one in the, in, in the garage. What you keep in a garage freezer? Uh, hot links, uh, some ribs one day, you know what I'm saying? So come on, man, my brother. Also. Okay, <laughs> number three winner for me is Jalen Hurts. Because he's the ah. leader. Ah, Jalen, first of all, you're, you're up here twice because I'm actually your boy. I'm actually the one that believes in you. You just did that for the cameras. Jalen Hurst went out there and did what he's supposed to do. All these question marks. Is he the leader of our team? Is he our franchise quarterback going forward? I always believe and I bet on workers. The talent's there. Now he's a worker. He's a man of character, a man of leadership. And now, got Philadelphia looking good in that division. Only winner from that division. My number two guy, oh, we got to stay right here in L.A. Matthew Stafford, what the hell? Doing All the aboard one. the hype train doing. when it comes to Matthew Stafford. What did he do in his week one performance with his new team? Just have a career high in passer rating. What did he do in his week one performance? Go out there 34 to 14 and win that game at home. Hey, they got a real quarterback, and I know you think they're going to be in the Super Bowl. I ain't going that far, but we'll see. My number one winner, though, this is simple. Arizona Cardinals and Kyler and Mr. Mr. Jones. Oh, my God. Kyler Murray out there, five total touchdowns. Whew, he's done so much with his feet, setting up his passing game, and he has the arm talent. But Chandler Jones, let me do this respectfully. Yes, respectfully. Play my position. Had a half a seasons of production in one game, damn it. I mean, he had a contract year. And he just had a contract game. <laughs> He's about to, <laughs> he about to say, uh, give me what T.J. Watt got and Joey Bosa. Combine them and add one. Yep. Chandler Jones is out there balling. That will do it for our week one winners and losers. Congrats to all you winners out there. And better luck next time for all the losers. Coming up, Cam Newton is still a free agent. Mm. We'll tell you if a reunion with Ron Rivera in Washington should be considered. <laughs> That's next. Oh, speak for yourself. What a scam, where? <laughs>
Ryan Fitzpatrick was put on IR. Two letters you don't like to hear in the NFL. And he's expected to miss six, eight weeks. So the rumor mill always flying around for a reunion between free agent quarterback Cam Newton and his former head coach of the Panthers, Ron Rivera. But reports say Washington believes in Taylor Heineke. Rivera said, quote, we like the guys we have. Okay, so mm -hmm. this ain't our segment, keep it 100, mm -hmm. though I wish it was. Ron <coughs> Rivera not keeping it 100, but keep it 100 with me, please. Should Washington consider signing Cam Newton? No. They should not consider signing Cam yeah. Newton. Right? I know, I know. Well, let me tell you how I got here, because I don't even want to play around with you like it sounds like the Washington football team and Ron Rivera wants to play around with Cam Newton. I'm not going, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm not going to put the gloves on. I'm going to take them off. I don't think that they will sign Cam right. Newton. Yep. So why even go through the process, the rigmarole, just to act like you are? I'm not into all that. Oh, let's give the complexion of diversity. If you ain't going to do it, I don't even need you to play with my emotions like this. And they're not going to do it. Now, I feel conflicted sitting up here talking about Cam Newton in not such a flattering way. But before I talk to anyone I care for, I always got to put them in a place emotionally that I do for my family and my friends, the people that I care for. Like, basically, my son. If I would tell my son this, I might have to tell my boy this. If I tell my boy this, I got to tell somebody who comes in contact with me. Cam, let's talk. <sighs> You're looking for a job. You're looking for employment. You're looking for an opportunity to show everybody that you still got it, right? Now, a lot of people are doubting that you have it. That's why you're unemployed. Now, when you're unemployed, it's a perception game that you must play. You must participate in. I know it's hard for you to understand this because you've always dictate terms. You're Cam Newton. When you're the top dog at anything, you don't have to do everything, right? <laughs> But Cam, you're now in this position, and I've been in this position before, where you need a little human capital, as they say. Mm -hmm. And look at this. Ron Rivera should be the first person we think of in terms of human capital. But Ron Rivera is the last person you think of because it just seems like he's distancing himself from Cam Newton. Cam Newton is losing the perception game. He doesn't have a lot of human capital. What is human capital? People that will move you to the front of the line when you don't necessarily qualify. People who move you to the front of the line or just give you the job and just go through the formatics of acting like I looked at everyone else. But they know they're going to look out for their dog. Cam ain't got nobody looking out for him right now. And let me tell you why. When you rent out, I don't know what, a high school, after hours, get a permit to sit down with your dad and talk about your situation presently, when your situation is not finalized because you still need an employment, for this to be cemented, you need to be working. Then you go out there and go after hours at a 50-yard line at a high school and tell people that, hey, I could have been a backup. Hey, I'm not going to be a distraction. It's a mixed message when you're watching an attraction. You're watching a dude on camera giving it to you full visual, vividly, that this guy is going to get attention. But he's also trying to sell you while you're watching it that he doesn't need the attention or he won't be a distraction in terms of attention. It's just all over the place, man. This is why there are people in PR and branding and marketing. Right now, Cam needs to just sit still gain some human capital, some more of the equity from people that do care for him, that do believe he still has it, and let that play itself out. Other than that, he gonna find himself at that high school again, still talk about why I'm unemployed. The question was, should Washington consider signing Cam Newton? We share an answer, so let's ask a better question. Mm. Why shouldn't they consider signing Cam Newton? Okay, I like that. I think that's I a like better that. question like right that. here. I'm not prepared for it, but I know you are because you always talk about this with me. Mm. Cam Newton... The first thing you have to ask yourself, can he help me win significant games? Mm. I don't think you have a concise or clear answer. Yeah. Right? I'm being kind, right? The easy way is just say no. Mm. But if you want to do some further investigative research, can Cam Newton help you win significant games? I'm not convinced, okay? Now, the second question you have to ask yourself, is Cam Newton a distraction? We know the answer to that is yes. Now, uh. someone can be a distraction without trying to be distracting. Oh, yes. So, like, it happens all the time. <laughs> Hell, it happens yeah. in a lot of aspects of life. Like, people, individuals, just by nature of their stature, just mm. by nature of their build, just mm. by nature of their anything, mm. they can be a distraction without intentionally trying to be distracting. Mm. That is where Cam Newton falls. It is not his fault. I will say it again. It is not his fault, but it's still the nature of the beast. Mm. The other kicker is Cam... 
you can't both try to, you know, master the media and master your craft. Mm. The reason I say so is I respect Cam Newton doing this YouTube show with his dad. Why? Yeah. Prepare for life after football. You might be closer to the end than you think. Go ahead and do that. But the only reason that YouTube video has views is because he said something controversial, saying that Mac Jones didn't want him to necessarily be the backup, yeah, or Mac Jones wouldn't have felt comfortable yep, yep. Cam Newton is a backup. Say it, that's the problem. Only reason you got views is because you were controversial. Well, that same controversy is going to keep you from having a job. Everybody so you can't have it both ways. I respect you, Cam, for doing a YouTube show. I've made a living off a YouTube <laughs> show. Right, right. So keep doing your thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just understand what it's costing you. Because you going out there making headlines with controversy is going to keep you from employment in the league. So we've established that the rep football team shouldn't give Cam Newton a job. But now diving into the why, mm. that's my why. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Because I'm not against YouTube. I'm not, obviously, I'm not against podcasts. I'm not against any of that. But what he's not saying is actually speaking louder than what he is saying. Just sitting there, just, the, just the, the animation of looking at Cam Newton telling you that the guy who just beat him out is going to feel uncomfortable with him. Okay, that lands, and that sounds polarizing because you're talking about another person, and you're talking about somebody who beat you out. But what's worse than that is you're saying, I'm not going to be a distraction. And we're looking like, dog, you are Cam Newton. Everywhere you go, you're a distraction. And you said it best. By not even trying to be distracting. I have a lot of homegirls. We always talk about that, especially the beautiful ones, the fine ones, the 11 homegirls I got. They can't go to the grocery store. They ain't trying to be a distraction. They, they dress down, baggy sweats, hat on, something. And then here comes some dude. Oh, can you pass me the peas? Like, like, dog, come on. Always, everywhere you go, there you are. Here's the thing about Cam Newton. He has to understand that most communication is nonverbal. And if most communication is nonverbal, we ain't got to hear it to see it. We know it. Cam, the distraction part, you ain't going to win that one. Even if you're correct, you're not going to win that one. Last time I saw Cam Newton was at the Super Bowl. Now, at the Super Bowl, it's interesting because you can do a litmus test to see who really is famous. Peyton Manning was sitting right next to me. Peyton Manning is super famous. He won the night. Right over there is Kirsten McCaffrey. There's Cam Newton, Odell Beckham Jr., et cetera. These are all, everybody I named. Is commanding attention. And everyone I named was sitting there just trying to eat with their friends and family, not trying to be a distraction. It still works that way. Oh, Cam got to understand that it's lazy almost now to just say Cam's going to Washington because of Ron Rivera. It's like how everybody was going to the Lakers because they spend their offseason in L.A. It's like, we got to look deeper than that. When you look deeper than that, you look at these situations where Cam Newton is not doing himself any favors and going back to these teams. Just like the quote, the Wileyism, the great Wileyism that you stole from my grandmother and didn't give her credit and had a tweet that went viral. <laughs> you can't call for attention and hang up. Cam too damn famous to be acting like now I'm just going to blend into the room like the walls. It ain't going to happen, but I hope it does because I want to see Cam still play. Coming up, Carson Wentz's season started off with a big, fat L. We're telling you if we're still sold on him and a few other quarterbacks. Or is this still TBD? Y'all going to figure it out. That's next on Speak for Yourself. We're done with week one of the NFL season. We still have some questions. So it's time for a new segment. We're calling it TBD or Soul. So let's get it started in Indy with Carson Wentz's first game. As a coach, started off with a loss to the Seahawks. Ah! But he did throw two touchdown passes with no interceptions. So, Acho, are you still TBD or sold on Wentz? I'm TBD on my dog Carson Wentz. Finally! I'm inching, I'm inching towards being sold. Let me break this down for y'all. Carson Wentz had 10 straight completions this past game. Might not seem like a big deal, but it's a huge deal, given his completion percentage was the worst of his career. We're trying to figure out. Can Wentz retain that 2017 form now that he's back with his partner in crime, Frank Wright? I think he can. So I'm not yet sold because I need to see more. Plus, they caught an L. Plus, Carson Wentz compared to Russell Wilson. They were both sharing the football field. Oh, they just looked like they was on <laughs> But I'm TBD. Hopefully by next week, your boy will be sold. Yeah, it looked like Atari versus PlayStation out there. Two different games out there. Um, I'm encouraged. 
but still TBD. Oh, Carson Wentz, man, it was encouraging to see that you had your first passer rating over 100 since 2019. You're back with your boy, Frank Reich. I get it. But now you're 3-8-1 and one in your last 12 starts. Good Lord. You lost five straight as a starter. Carson Wentz, I don't know, man. It's just... It just seems like it's such a tough climb for you to just be who you are. And I think you got the talent in you, but, man, the consistency needs to be there as well. We'll see going forward, TBD. Let's move on to Houston. Tyrod Taylor led the Texans to a week one win over the Jaguars. They got the win without Deshaun Watson. So, Acho, you still TBD or sold on Tyrod Taylor? Man, you know me, Sal. Your boy's indecisive. Why I'm super single, they say. <laughs> uh, man, I'm still TBD. Why? We set the bar low for Tyrod Taylor, and he jumped over it. But we set it low, so can we really, oh, really? be sold so quickly? He beat a team, but that team was 1-15 last year, the Jacksonville Jaguars. That team started a rookie quarterback. Yes, Tyrod Taylor balled. I told y'all, over 300 total yards, two touchdowns, and most importantly, the W. But I still need to see more, or... I need to see the same thing against better competition. Oh, really? You need to see more? And we set the bar low. Oh, man, I'm sold on Tyrod Taylor. Um, he's 25, 21, and 1 as a starter. That's a great win percentage. Even greater than, um, drum roll, Deshaun Watson. Oh, let's not go there. Had his highest passer rating in, since 2017. Went out there and scored points and gave the Jags the business. The 291 passing yards he gave the Jags. Most against the Jags since 2016. I hate to say this, man. Y'all going to mess around, and Deshaun Watson is going to become an afterthought with Tyrod Taylor in town. He's going to go get traded for a seventh rounder and some Whataburger sauce. And it's time to go to Green Bay. I ain't right. Where Aaron Rodgers had the worst margin of defeat in his career. Reigning MVP finished with two picks, no touchdown passes. Mm. Acho. TBD, sold. Aaron Rodgers. Three for three, TBD. Yeah, what you doing um, a segment for if you ain't going to be sold on that? Because why, Sal? How you want me to be sold on Aaron Rodgers when it's the same dude who missed all of OTAs because he was in Hawaii, same dude who during training camp he didn't really know what he wanted, same dude who finally said what he wanted and he wanted Randall Cobb, same dude who was offended, and now you want to come out and lay an egg? How you want me to jump immediately to being sold on Aaron Rodgers? I get it. He's great. But the thing is, I do not think we will see the same level of greatness this season, at least not based upon that atrocious week one performance. It's just one game. But eventually one game becomes two. Two games become three. Three games become four. Playing the Detroit Lions this week, so don't even ask me next week, Sal. Ask me after week three how I feel about Aaron Rodgers so the man, Detroit Lions don't count. Man, full disclosure, America. This is his idea. This is his segment. He ain't sold on nothing. I'm sold on Aaron Rodgers, dang it. I'll be the one that keeps it balanced up here. You talking about he, we won't see the same level of MVP greatness. Yeah, he might not win MVP back to back, but he's still going to ball out because he's Aaron Rodgers. Last time I saw him have a game this bad last year, 35 passer rating, lost to the Bucks. What did he do the next week? Destroy the Texans, 132 passer rating. Who does he have this week? The Detroit Lions. 2-0 against them last year. 70% completion percentage, five touchdowns, no interceptions, 122 passer rating. That's what Aaron Rodgers do. The greats respond. We all fall down. But if you're great, you got to get up. Coming up, Tom Brady is trolling the Falcons ahead of their week two matchup. Or is it? We'll tell you if he's being petty or funny or something else. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Now we all remember when Tom Brady's Patriots came back from a 28-3 deficit against the Falcons in the Super Bowl a few years ago. Yeah, I remember that one far too well. Well, <laughs> Brady definitely remembers. He was hyping up their matchup on Sunday, and he just happened to have the numbers 328 on the computer screen behind him. <laughs> I love it. So, Brady yes. being petty or funny? Oh, there's only one choice here. It's funny because... The plausible deniability of this one. Like, the politician of Brady. Like, him and his team at work. Like, what do you mean? It was just after practice, after a workout. What the, I don't know what time it is. That's what makes it hilarious. It can't be petty. Let me box you in right now. Because when it's petty, you're trying too hard or you're doing too damn much. Brady's doing neither. He's just like, what you talking about? I'm just doing a video. Just happy to be 328. So, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Oh, it's right? I think you can be both petty and funny. Um, I think it was both. 
I think one is petty. Oh, oh. because here's the kickers. Let's go. Brady, you don't even play for the Patriots anymore. It was the Patriots that came back from the 28th. That's still Tom Brady. I get it, but you rep the Bucks now. Really? So, like, you still making jokes from your own old squad. Oh, another squad. Oh, I, just, okay. I don't really... Oh. Get it, but oh, oh, for New England it. fans, those in Boston, I'm sure it was funny. Mm. But to me, I'm just like, are we not over it yet? We ain't moved past it. Baby. Oh, really? So if you won a gold medal for Nigeria and then you came to America, you wouldn't be happy for your gold medal there because now you with America, you can't still be happy. To you still making break. jokes? Are you still shooting shots? Damn shooting right! Down. Did I do it? I'm got to sh see. Now you're trying to make me say he's petty. He's not being petty. This was hilariously funny. Like it's so intentionally unintentional. Intentional. Like. That's the best jokes there are. Are you okay? Do you need some comedy relief? You don't but think it, that's it, funny? No, if you have to try too hard to make the joke. That's hard? Yeah, he had to set his clock. Somebody went there in the old school joints, like all 3, 28 p.m. Trying too hard. Well, you got me. But Kevin Durant's not funny and petty? All right, that's it for us. We'll see you tomorrow. Talk to you there.